second. Hello, hello, hello. All right. Uh, so we are officially live. And uh, this is an interview that uh, we were going to do as part of our Amplify event. Uh, so we decided now instead to do it as its own solo interview. So uh, Davis Hahn, I'm super excited to have you here with me today. And Davis, where I'd like to start is perhaps just to ask you, I always like to get our guests to tell us about themselves. So I'd like to get you to tell us just a little bit about your background and who you are, if you don't mind. Well, I am uh, quite a canine enthusiast, so to speak. Um, long story, but I led a life that involved codependency and kind of almost took my life. And uh, I gifted a dog to someone, a puppy, which was very foolish. But in turn, the gift that I gave to someone else, I got stuck with. And that puppy grew to save my life, not once, but twice. Wow. And so you say you gifted and then got stuck with. So you gifted it and then they didn't, ha they weren't able to take the puppy. Is that essentially it? Well, it was codependency with an addict okay. and the puppy ended up taking the abuse and then I learned through channels that the puppy was destined to be traded for rocks or crack cocaine to the drug dealer and I couldn't let that happen so I exited stage left in my life and I took that puppy but I resented the puppy because I couldn't get a hotel room because I had a darn dog I, every time I walked in, friendly people came out, what a cute puppy. And I'm like, get out of here. And I resented that puppy for, for quite some time. Hmm. Wow. And so, and it makes sense now to me, you know, in terms of how you ended up with a puppy uh, based on that scenario. So I guess what turned things around? You know, you said you resented it for quite you know, some time. My parents were alcoholic and they say that maybe sometimes when you grow up, you have a master's degree in taking care of the addict in your life, rescuing the wounded bird. And that's kind of what I did. And then I said, well, maybe mother nature through a puppy could do what I couldn't do and help me rescue the wounded bird. It was very foolish, but at that time, my life was very foolish. Um, I bought a camper, I went out West. I was in a little town, Ajo, Arizona. And uh, I had the dog and uh, one night I drank a gallon of vodka, I had a knife, I almost did the unconscionable. And in the morning I woke up to children knocking at my camper door. Mister, we have a dog, can our dog play with your dog? Yeah, take the darn dog. 15 minutes later, the dog screamed in pain and I just knew that he'd been hit by a car because everything in life was just dismal. And I opened that camper door expecting to see the dead puppy. He was holding his paw. He'd heard it on a trailer hitch, changing the, changing the other puppy. And he was crying. And, you know, I had resented him because he was always happy. And I was always miserable. We were polar opposites. But in that moment, and I call it a Helen Keller-like epiphany, I got it. We were both in pain. His was physical. Mine was psychological. And the kids were crying. I was crying. The dog was crying. I brought the dog inside. I slept for virtually three days with that puppy in my arms. I woke up. I looked into his eyes and said, you know, I get it. I really get it. You've been pulling me to healthy, happy people. If you love an animal, often you put their needs above your own. These are like pre-qualified, wonderful humans, right? And I made him a promise to share him with the world. And I've done my best to do so. Hmm. Wow, I love what you just said. They're pre-qualified uh, humans. I, I love, that's amazing. Um, so let me ask you this then. Um, I know that you, this, this is still wild to me. I know you had a dog cloned and I don't know anybody else ever that I've ever talked to that I've said those words. So can you tell us about that and about that process? Absolutely. <clears throat> First, I'll tell you, I, t I took a hit for cloning my dog because people think, oh, you're playing God. No, I love what God gave me so much. I just wanted another copy. I didn't want longer legs, blue eyes. I just, and why did I clone? Because I went the, the, the 
when I decided to share my dog with the world, I needed an education. I went out to California, trained under Dr. Benita Bergen, who founded the service dog concept. In her 60s, she founded a college. Who in the right mind in her 60s, right? Cancels the camper and the vacations and the retirement to continue educating. And let me tell you, that lady is an educator. She has a PhD in education. She can take your mind and just transfer it into the moment, into the educational experience. She gave me the tools to go forth in the world to keep my promise to my dog, Booster. One of my classes, I read about cloning, fired off an email to the one Korean scientist in the world that was doing it, that won the race to clone the dog, I think in competition at the time with Texas A&M. I never thought I'd hear back. I got an email, hey, come to Seoul. I'm like, well, heck yeah. Jumped on a plane, went to a biotech. Welcome to SOAM Biotech, Davis Hall and Bergen University, Canine Studies on a monitor, quite an honor. And uh, they showed me a microscope and the needle going into the, dog, into the dog's egg, extracting all the DNA information, a needle implanting the donor DNA into the surrogate's egg. Took me into the operating room, put me in a zoot suit, whatever. Opened up the female, put the eggs in the ovaries, and he said in 63 days, the puppies will be born. At that time, it was 100 grand to clone a dog. I didn't have 100 grand to clone a dog. If I spent 100 grand to clone a dog, send me to Dr. Phil immediately on a stretcher. Right? But I wanted to clone my dog because he had such unique attributes. At that time, he had traveled all over the world. Um, communist Cuba under Fidel Castro, live television, live radio. They called him the doctor dog. Thailand, visiting kids with HIV. Children with cancer and autism in Mexico. Visited classrooms in Costa Rica, all over the world. And I got to tell you that people thought I was crazy at age 50 something to go back and get a master's degree in dog, canine life sciences. That was the most life-changing experience in my life. I think if you wanted to become the world's greatest janitor, if you went and got an education, all things are possible. Um, one little humorous comment. I went to a party for my niece before she got married years ago and my sister was upset. She said, I can't believe you told people you were cloning your dog. Do you know how embarrassing that is? And I'm like, you know, I study dogs. I had a purpose. I wanted a dog that had the same attributes. You're not guaranteed personality. But if you train the dog in the same way, it's like, to me, it's like baking a cake. The same ingredients in the same oven at the same temperature, you get the same cake. I lived in Korea for two months training those puppies. And uh, 15 minutes twice a day, got in the subway in Seoul, went across the city. The biotech was wonderful. Professor Wang Wusak opened the doors for me every day. And uh, today I have Booster's clones, Boosted and Busted. Booster stole a toy from a pet store once. He was a thief, he was a booster. But I boosted his cells, sent them to Korea and I got busted for it. And what I mean by that is, there should have been maybe one born. There were actually eight eggs implanted into one circuit, 10 into the other. And out of 18, two came full term. And when I arrived in Korea, they picked me up in a Mercedes, brought me to the biotech. Usually they do a C-section. That's a $100,000 puppy in that dog's stomach. They don't want to risk it. Well, Bonnie said, you know, that puppy needs the experience of the birthing process. It needs the stress because it's going to be encountering stress as a service dog all of its life. So I insisted that the Koreans allow the surrogate to have a real live birth. It's all scientific. Well, when they picked me up, they said, Mr. Dave, there's something we have to tell you. Remember, we sent you a sonogram of the fetal heartbeat, and I'm ready for them to tell me that the puppy was stillborn. Well, we, we made a mistake, Mr. Dave, and I'm like, here it comes. Well, we should have done a second sonogram, Mr. Dave. Okay, here it comes. Well, Mr. Dave, there were two fetal heartbeats. You have two baby boosters, Mr. Dave. And originally I wasn't sure how to handle that, but I said, how fascinating to compare the clone to my original dog booster. Now I could compare clone to clone to the original dog booster. 
it's been fascinating. I even I got contacted or wrote a response on Psychology Today and, uh, and, and delved into what people thought about it. But it, it's, it's very interesting. Um, I'd like to add that there's a term called CRISPR, C-R-S-P-R. And they can genetically, if your children are born with an abnormality, they can determine if it's the husband or the wife, let's say, that has a defect. Cut out that little snippet, take a donor snippet, weld it in, and now the children you can have and they won't have a disability. The problem is you're altering the DNA for all successive generations, right? You might be opening the door to new cancers, more frequency of coming down with the flu or line. So that has its elements. Cloning to me is very pure. You're not changing the DNA. You're not opening up the world to maybe new diseases. So really cloning is the nicer maybe of the two evils, but people think that cloning is witchcraft. For me, let me tell you something. When Booster was ready to meet his maker, it was depressing as hell. I, I, you know, I'd almost done the unthinkable once. I would like to say that I promised him I would never do that or consider that, but it was life altering. He wasn't just a dog. He was a way of life. He was my raison d'etre, my reason for being. Met people all over the world. He was such a unique creature. And I didn't know how I was going to handle it, to be honest with you. And I mean, I'm only a human. And uh, when Professor Wong reached out, his number two guy, and said, Professor Wong, he sees you try to help people. You love the dog. As a child, he loved the cow. And he wants to clone your dog. And they gave me a significant discount to make it happen. And I just happened to have sold, coincidentally, which is no such thing, my business at the time. So I had a few extra coins and I spent it on cloning. Um, I will tell you briefly, there was a family out of Louisiana that had saved up to buy a Land Rover automobile. They decided to spend that money on cloning. They said the car would depreciate, whereas the puppy and the dog would appreciate over the years to come. And I love that. And that's absolutely true in my life. So I have to ask you a couple of things there. I mean, you answered one question I had, which was how you did come up with the money, because you said I didn't have that lying around. And so you answered that uh, question, of course. The other side, though, uh, as far as one thing I was curious about, I want to make sure I understood correctly. So you ended up having two puppies. And they, Booster was still around with them? Yes, for about a year, he got to know his clones. Okay. And so you said uh, you, you found it fascinating because now you could compare, like you say, clone to clone to a, a creator or original. Um, so what, what was the comparison? Like, did you ultimately right. say these are dead <clears throat> Physic on? Physically, they are the same. When you clone, it's a physical, unless you have spots like a calico cat, you're not yeah. going to get the spots in the same place. It has to do with the mitochondria, the energy house of the cell. Um, but physically, even the little white patch ended up on both dogs. Personality-wise, I'd say they are about 90% the same. When Boosted lays on the ground, he will cross his front paws like that, just like Booster did. Now, Busted doesn't, but Boosted every time, it just every time he does it, he reminds me of my original dog. Um, obviously they love to retreat. The fascinating thing is when they're born very soon, you're aware that they're kind of ahead of the pack, pardon the pun. It's like they're born as a one-year-old dog and some of the previous life experiences seem to come through. The first time I sent them to open a truck door and get a medical kit, they did it as though they'd been doing it all their life. They had never opened a truck door refrigerator door yes truck door no and i'll tell you they interviewed me on dateline nbc they didn't air the footage but they interviewed a military dog trainer and they had five belgian mountain Mop cloned puppies and i'm telling him i'm seeing previous life experience coming through he said dave i'm seeing it too his kennels in the u.s he said, Dave, I walk one of those Malinois. It's two years old now. Started snapping and snarling in public. I could barely hold him. In 30 years, I've never had a dog act like that. There were these tall bushes, these box bushes. Behind those bushes were two gentlemen 
from Afghanistan with the white robes on, the dog was ready to tear him apart. You see, the original dog was trained to sniff out the enemy in Afghanistan. Right. The clown was responding to the training of the original dog. It had never received that training. Really cool stuff. So I joke with my friends, it begs the question, would my parrots have cloned me? Heck no. <laughs> never in a million years. I could just hear them clone the dog, but don't clone our son, whatever you do. That's wild. <laughs> I like that. And so um, the other thing I'm curious about, and I don't know how this works at all, really, but whenever you have a dog like Booster, who had been with you for so long and had built up, I'm sure, an affection for you, how does that translate? Like, does that carry over or, or you do you build it up again? You know, I, I absolutely feel that it does. When those dogs look at me, there's just something, you know, I always say that the, the, the eyes are the window to the soul. There is a devotion. And let me tell you, Booster had a girlfriend. Her name was Puppy. Cute little they called her Piggy from birth because she was so big. 25% of labs, I think, have a, an obesity gene. Um, and I think she's one of those. But anyway, I cloned her in the U.S. And um, different experience, which I won't go into. But anyway, I've got her. Um, and from the minute she was born, I call her Puffers. She absolutely clung to me. The day she was delivered, she ran to me looked at me and anytime I go anywhere, she's like glue. It was very strange. I've had a lot of puppies over the years, but there was a very strong bond or glue connection. And I have no question because that came through the cloning. And so I guess that's my other question. And it's more just curiosity because I know how much you love dogs. How many do you have now? I am one time had 10 full-grown Labradors. I had a big Nissan Titan truck with a camper and I'd put 10 dogs, five in, five in the back. I have a mountaintop home in Arkansas. It's the canine retreat. And I rent it out now to share it with people, Airbnb and Verbo. And people come from all over the country to go to the canine retreat. But I put all 10 dogs in my truck. One time I got to my property. It's a 10 hour drive from Mississippi where I lightning thunder rain I, and there's a creek right as you get onto my pro i couldn't cross the creek i had to go into a nearby town and rent a motel room with 10 hundred pound labradors i don't know if anybody else on the planet has done so i just asked the gentleman in the front please give me a room in the back i'm tired of been driving i one by one took the dogs out in the rain with an umbrella and put them in the room finally got a little sleep went back and trust me, the room was as clean as it was, maybe a little cleaner than when I first walked through the front door. But it does present challenges. And uh, I mean, I, again, just the way my mind works, but I'm curious, the the person working there, like, have you run into anything with that? Like where you're going walking in with 10 that they're like- Oh, no, no, I've never walked in with 10 before. I didn't walk in with 10 there. They didn't know, you know, my, my okay. vehicle was in the back and I walked to the office. Nobody okay. in their right mind would rent a room, <clears throat> an apartment or a camper, maybe even a tent to somebody that's got 10 dogs. Got it. You know, I, people more so in the U.S. than in Europe, for some reason, I don't want to say have an adversity, but they think dogs are all destructive. Um, in my Airbnb units, children do far more innocent, but far more damage than a dog could ever have thought um but you know i couldn't get a hotel room originally with the dog and and you know we have the americans with disabilities act which when they're a service dog but at that time he was not and even with a service dog you catch a lot of grief from restaurants or businesses and part of that is due to the selfish behavior of humans who have pet dogs <clears throat> who have not received any training neither has the human and they take those dogs into places and mishaps occur. And those people are very selfish because let me tell you, people need service dogs and they're being used more and more in more ways, but they are professional dogs trained to overcome a specific disability. 
I will share that today, 22 out of 24 hours a day, U.S. veterans are committing suicide. As we are speaking, there is a veteran committing suicide, most likely. An hour later will be another one. Those are our national heroes. Bonnie Bergen at Bergen University started a program, Paws for Purple Hearts. She was having veterans with psych issues, train dogs for veterans that have like TBI, traumatic brain injuries or the like. And what they have found is that by working with the dog, the veterans, the, the ramifications of PTSD seem to come down. And then you say, how do you train a dog to help somebody like that? Well, let me tell you, when they wake up, and I have done this, when they wake up in bed screaming, ah, and the bomb's falling, the dog wakes them up from the drama, hits the runs, hits the light switch, will open the refrigerator, bring them water or Gatorade, circle the house maybe to let them know that there's really nothing there, and maybe go to the counter and get the, get the med kit, bring it to them, then when they calm down, they can turn the light switch off and the dog hops back on the bed with the veteran and the two of them go to sleep. When they, uh, veterans, I think, I, and truthfully, I did the same thing. I'd go from zero to 180 when I was confronted due to history in my life. You know, you tap it back just that quickly. We train the dog to heal backwards, get my back. So if you approach that person in a line, and they are startled, you don't get a punch. The dog lets them know in advance, hey, somebody's coming up behind you, chill out, dude. We even tell the dog block, and the dog will lay down on the floor in front of the veteran. Now, when you come up to that veteran or the person with PTSD as I've had, they're not gonna step on a dog's stomach and get into your face. If I get into your face, right, ah, you start getting nervous, right? Try getting in an elevator and look in somebody's eyes. You'll be lucky if you don't get punched. So the dog does something simple, block. It keeps a comfort zone. So a lot of this stuff is very subtle. And it might seem minimal to your eye, but for those people, it's life enabling. Yeah, it's uh, this, for whatever reason, it reminded me of a friend I have who has uh, type one diabetes. And for a while he was having really bad um episodes at night when he was sleeping like he'd wake up and and his his uh girlfriend knew you know what to give him and stuff to bring him out of it and they had a um a bulldog not trained at all but the bulldog could sense when he was going into it and the bulldog would start going crazy and go into the closet and make noises because it was scared but that what that happening would wake her up so she knew to help him and, you know, it's not that was like just an example of how the dog was triggering it without even realizing, but it was pretty well, fast. And, and, you know, the amazing thing is, you know, children's bodies, <clears throat> excuse me, their, uh, I guess their, their blood levels, sugar levels, maybe vacillate more than that of an adult. So we take the dogs and put them on the foot of the child's bed at night. And if the child's blood sugar drifts, then what happens is you release, um, ketones, sweetness, you perspire. The dog smells that sweetness, they've been given a treat. They smell it, they've been given a treat. When that child starts to slip into a coma in that bed, that dog would jump up, run to the parent's bed, wake them up in the middle of the night, give me my treat, okay? And it can save that child's life. Um, it's, it's, and, and we have, and, and it's because they smell the sweetness and the perspiration. We have seizure alert and response dogs, two different categories. We're not quite sure how the seizure alert dog works, whether you're putting off a, a, a scent or maybe a, a look or an electronic impulse. But the dog can tell you, don't bite that steak because it's going to get caught in your throat 10 minutes from now when you have a seizure. And the problem is, <clears throat> if you can't bring those dogs with you into public, what the heck good are they? Not only is it not advantageous, at that point, it's detrimental. So imagine you're in front of a restaurant, maybe they don't allow the dog in. What do you do? Tie it to the step out front while you eat? Then comes this stray dog down the sidewalk that's aggressive and attacks your service dog. Now you're worried about the dog and you can lose your dog if you don't have that public access. So it became a passion for me 
to explain that simple concept. And uh, I've gone into other countries. I can tell you tonight, a person, a veteran with no legs or somebody uh, with seizures or what have you, in the Bahamas can by law get a hotel room. I spent eight years there. And uh, I, they said they'd never get a national disability law. Brewster went in <clears throat> within eight years, television, newspaper, churches, and we helped them get the law. Funny though. After he passed, I went with one of the clones, both of them back to the Bahamas the following year to kind of celebrate. The taxi driver wouldn't allow the clone into the dog and, and the clone dog into the taxi. So I went into the police station in Freeport. Excuse me, officer, I need to make a report. There's a vi get the dog out. Excuse me, officer. He's a service dog. You heard what he said. He said, get the dog out. Menacingly. Third officer chimed in. I got the heck out and I called the president of disability council. Hey, you're not gonna believe what just happened to me. What happened, again, coincidence, uh-uh. They had a uh, conference for all the, all the uh, chief of police for the entire country of the Bahamas on that island two days later. The ones that couldn't attend, it was broadcast, right? So they invited me and I demonstrated what the dogs could do. And I said, you know, People are worried about getting attacked by a pack of dogs. You know, you all fight dogs on the islands. But I was attacked by a pack of police officers in a police station in violation of your national law. Come on, guys. Am I angry? Not at all. I spent two years of my life getting an education, master's degree with a wonderful dog. And you've invited me to your conference. How cool is that? And I want to thank you on behalf of a lot of the disabled folks, because, you know, before that, if they went to the Bahamas and they had a guide dog, were they going to sleep in the street because the hotel wouldn't let them in? Were they going to eat in the street because they didn't allow the dog? And I go into countries. I was in Mexico in November. I took government officials to a fancy restaurant, a little chain across the door to kind of control the seating. No mascota, no pet. I, let the, I said, guys, y'all go on in, <clears throat> get your table. <clears throat> and I was in coat and tie, well-dressed. And I sat on the dirty curb of their restaurant and said, okay, please serve me my sushi here. So the government officials are inside in Tepic, Mexico at the dinner table. I'm coat and tie sitting in a dirty curb waiting for my dinner to be served. You know what happened? They lowered the chain and said, come on in, sir. And I took them to those government officials. You see, this is what happens. What are people blind? What is your mom, your sister, your child? It's crazy. And so it's become a passion to travel with a trained dog, with an education from Bergen University, Kansas. Amazing. Well, Davis, you know, I mean, I could continue this conversation for hours. Uh, so with your permission, I'll call it a to be continued and let's make this happen again. But until that time, uh, you know, I'll, I'll ask you one final question, which is for those that want to learn more about this. I mean, it's fascinating the work you've done in your life and, and the contribution it's made to so many. So I guess the question for those that want to learn more, see how they can connect, whatever that looks like uh, to them. Is there a place like a hub, a website that you would send them? Well, of course, I'm going to have one, and I've got a book entitled My Booster coming out. Um, I would encourage, Bonnie's school has a six-week train-the-trainer seminar. First three weeks, you're the student. Second three weeks, you're the teacher, and you teach the disabled how to use their dog. It's kind of a boot camp, a seminar every summer. If you're looking for a second vocation in life and to find meaning, I would absolutely suggest that you go out to that six-week seminar there is nothing like it on the planet. And while Bonnie is still around, you have that opportunity to learn from an amazing person. Um, <clears throat> of course, the internet's full of stories and things. Um, and maybe go tour Guide Dogs for the Blind in California or some of the institutions. When I did that, I, it was really cool. You heard birds chirping in one part of the campus and you heard something else, Beethoven in another part of the campus. The blind knew where they were on the campus based upon the environmental sounds in the background. How cool was that? So there's all kinds of ways to learn all kinds of things. Um, and one of the best ways is to, if you're disabled, get a service dog, get it trained properly. You get the training, travel with that dog, <clears throat> and you're going to learn 
about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Amazing. So yeah. Davis, this has been an absolute pleasure. Like I say, with your permission, I'll call it a to be continued. And let's just say till next time. Well, thank you. I pre and I'd say ciao, but instead I'm going to say Labrador Retriever. I love it. Well, that's amazing. Thank you so much, Davis. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And like I said to Davis, I'll say it to everybody else, till next time, to be continued. See you guys later. Uh, keep following us for uh, more great interviews like this. And thanks, Davis, for all the great work you're doing in the world. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks again. See you, everybody.